Tonight, Google blocked an email message because Goldman Sachs asked them to do it. A Wi-Fi warning for Android users. Uber gets the okay in the UK for now. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 122 for Thursday, July 3rd, 2014. I'm Father Robert Balliser. Let's get right to the tech feed. Google agreed to block access to an email message at the request of Goldman Sachs, according to an exclusive by Reuters. A contractor working for Goldman Sachs accidentally sent the Gmail message to a stranger on June 23rd. The message contained highly confidential brokerage account information. Goldman Sachs spokeswoman Andrea Raphael said that the email account in question had not been accessed between the time the email was sent and when Google blocked it. Goldman Sachs is also seeking a court order to have Google delete the email, something the company has not yet done. A Google spokeswoman declined to comment. Do you have an Android phone? Well, if you do, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has issued you a warning that there is a high risk your device has been broadcasting your location history to anyone within Wi-Fi range. The EFF says Wi-Fi devices that are not actively connected to a network can send out messages that contain the names of the networks that they've joined in the past in an effort to speed up the connection process. A feature in Android called Preferred Network Offload allows devices to establish and maintain Wi-Fi connections in low power mode. It's this feature that can broadcast the names of Wi-Fi networks that you've connected to when the screen is off. Google has told the EFF that they are investigating and may implement changes in a future software update. If you've searched for Tor software or the operating system Tails in an effort to stay hidden online, then the NSA could be tracking you. This is according to the German public broadcaster ARD. Tor is used to route your IP address through several encrypted nodes so that the user's activity is disguised. Tor is a popular tool used by online activists as well as hackers and those who believe their activity online is their business and their business alone. In a statement, an NSA spokeswoman said the agency collects only what it is authorized by law to collect for valid foreign intelligence purposes, regardless of the technical means used by foreign intelligence targets. After a series of protests from taxi drivers throughout Europe, Uber has a small victory for now. Today, Transport for London decided to allow Uber to continue operating. The battle is centered around the technology. Under law, only the city's black taxis can use meters to charge customers. The drivers argue that the Uber app is, in fact, a meter. In a statement for Transport for London, said that phones are not taxi meters within the meaning of the legislation, but Uber is not yet in the clear. A court will soon rule on whether Uber's technology is considered a meter. And that case is not expected to be heard until the fall. So for now, Uber can operate in London. Meanwhile, stateside in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, both Uber and Lyft were issued ceased and desist orders and must immediately stop operations. The Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission says it understands the apps are popular and that many people rely on them. But the commission's three biggest concerns are driver background checks, proper insurance, and proper inspections of Uber and Lyft cars and drivers. The two companies have seven days to respond to the PUC on the decision. The organization will then make a final decision 30 days from today based on the full body of evidence. Coming up, what's more American than an American flag made of bacon? Well, we'll show you how it's done. But first, Dan Shu, Editor-in-Chief from Games B. Thank you so very much for joining us again. Thank you for having me. Now, Dan... Women in technology is a big issue that's gotten a lot of attention lately. It's been the focus of diversity reports from big tech companies. It was a topic at Google I.O. And now there's a debate over women competing with men in competitive gaming. Shu, what's that all about? Yeah, it's really interesting because uh, what came out at the end of this month uh, in Finland, there's going to be a big uh, international tournament called the Assembly Summer 2014. And uh, it recently came out that there were some competitions where women were not allowed to compete in, um, including some of the top games. And why this is important is now 
we have to look at it objectively and fairly because it's not a matter of just simply the, these show organizers just said, you know what, we don't like women and we don't want them part a part of this. Uh, they basically made that decision, previous decision, based on the fact that in Korea, the South, uh, um, and I wrote this down to make sure I got this right, South Korean International Esports Federation, or IESF for short, uh, because they don't have um, a co-ed uh, division for gaming, and they determine the international championships. The the Finnish uh, d- tournaments are just following their lead because they want to make sure whoever wins in Finland could go on to the finals in Korea. So you have to look at the big picture, but it is a, sort of a messed up situation because – and the reason why the Koreans d- uh, have a separate – division for females that are not letting the females compete in the biggest games is because what they're trying to do is get esports, you know, the, which is playing video games competitively, recognized as an international sport to be in the Olympics and so on. And they're making some progress there, but because because actual real sports in Olympic sports are segregated into male and female sides, they feel like the video games have to kind of follow that as well and have a male division and female division. So then the debate debate becomes, right, does that make sense? Because uh, while it might make sense to have male weightlifters, for example, versus and have a separate division for female weightlifters, it doesn't make as much sense to do that in competitive gaming where you're it's just hand eye coordination and using controllers, using a keyboard and mouse and so on. All right. So if, if that's what the rules were, what are the rules changing to? So, you know, thanks to the Internet and all of this uh, controversy, the all of this came out. Uh, Blizzard, which is the maker of the game in question, it's called uh, Hearthstone, which is a card game. It's become very popular lately. Uh, so this is this Hearthstone, tar- Hearthstone tournament where this all came up. So then Blizzard, of course, was not happy. And they went on record and saying this, this is not something we're cool with. Uh, we're going to look into this. We're going to see about making changes. And very soon after all of this, within a day, the uh, Assembly Summer 2014 and the uh, South Korean International Esports Federation, they all made changes to the policy to allow to reverse it. And now women can play in the Hearthstone tournament. And, uh, you know, it's not clear if this all came because of pressure from the Internet or because of more pressure from Blizzard, the maker of the game. But in the end, you know, uh, cooler minds prevailed and now everyone can compete on fair levels. Now, so we've heard mostly what the players want and a little bit about what Blizzard wants, but is there any movement from the game developers themselves? I mean, is, has there been a stance other than Blizzard saying how they would like professional gaming to look? Well, I think in general, you'll find that whether you're talking about the, the organizers of the tournaments or the makers of the games, I think they're all for equality because there's really no reason for there not to be, you know, because uh, when you're creating gates, for example, if you look at the the overall market, now this differs depending on whether you're talking about mobile, social, hardcore games, console games, PC games, but the general overall game demographic in the world is a 50-50. It's, it's 50% women to 50% male gamers. So uh, any organization that requires participation from gamers uh, they require consumers they need people to spend money there uh, it'd be stupid for them to uh, to sort of like just exclude a portion of that audience now you know this is a separate discussion you know you could, you could take a look at how some games are are clearly uh, designed for with men in mind, you know, with like underdressed women, uh, women and women characters and skimpy outfits that just don't appeal to real life women. Um, so, you know, that's a separate discussion altogether. But in general, if it's a card game like Hearthstone, there's no reason to discriminate, for example. So it, and there's no reason for tournament organizers to want to exclude women unless you want to talk about the fact that most competitive gamers are male. You know, so th- then you, you sort of have a similar argument to uh, say, you know, it, it's not apples to apples. And I, I feel stupid now even bringing up this comparison. But, you know, if you talked about, let's say the military had this issue in the past of it being a mostly male dominated career and then whether to let females into the military. I think esports is kind of going through a little bit of that right now. It's like, OK, this is a Competitive gaming is mostly male dominated, and will those participants feel comfortable having uh, female counterparts? Uh, but you know, it's it's an ongoing issue. It's a it's an issue that's being actively talked about, and companies are aware of it, organizers are aware of it, and at least steps are being made in uh, are being uh, being made in the right direction. 
I think the takeaway is that female gamers are here. The competitive gaming world needs to get used to it. That's Dan Shu, the editor in chief at GamesBeat. Shu, how can people get uh, get in touch with you? Well, the easiest way is probably my Twitter that you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, Dan Shu, and then my last name, which is a -S -S H S U. But uh, yeah, and then we're at GamesBeat.com. Thank you, Shu. Thank you very Thank much. You. As you know, tomorrow is the 4th of July, so here's a great way to get your Patriot on with bacon. The Business Insider has a helpful video showing you how to make an American flag out of three strips of bacon and blue cheese. Basically, you bake the bacon in the oven over a skewer, then add a chunk of blue cheese on the warm bacon, and voila, a real-life American flag that you can eat. That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I have made fire! Don't forget to subscribe to us at twit.tv slash TN2. We're not going to light up like 40 of them at the same time. That is such a bad idea. Our next newscast will be Monday, 10 a.m. with Mike Elgin for Tech News Today. Ow! Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballasair. Good night and happy 4th of July. Ah! Oh, that's awesome right there. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.